Okay. So thank you for inviting me to teach here. So yeah, I'll, t I'll talk about, uh, so in the first hour, about bridging activity, neural activity and perception, and in the second hour, how I'll talk about the, what's called the Bayesian hypothesis, whether the brain can be thought as a, as a Bayesian machine or not. <coughs> so the problem uh, here is uh, when we consider a neural circuit, so may, or maybe your model producing spikes with a lot of connections, etc., or when we are looking at a given cortical area in the brain, the question we can ask is how efficient is that neural activity for coding, and in particular in terms of, of predictions for behavioral performances. Uh, so we want to understand what are the impacts of specific features of this neural activity, and also uh, of the variability in this neural circuit, for predictions for performances. And I'm going to argue that uh, <coughs> a very useful framework to answer these kind of questions is this encoding-decoding framework. So I'm going to argue that we can view perception and to some extent also be, uh, behavior uh, in terms of an encoding-decoding cascade. And in that model, <coughs> so we are going to use statistical models and we are going to look at the transformation between a sensory stimulus and a population response in some area in the brain through an encoding kind of mechanisms, uh, through the, the properties of, of a set of neurons. <coughs> so transformation between a sensory stimulus and population response, that's, it, that's the encoding stage. And then the transformation between this population response and uh, perception. So what, what is, um, what's the response of the subject maybe in terms of what he or she is perceiving or how, it's, uh, how he or she is behaving. So the, the response as you can measure on a, on, on a psychophysical task. So this would be the encoding stage and this is the, the decoding stage and we can frame those stages in a statistical way. So the encoding stage is really about uh, describing the statistics of the responses at this stage given a stimulus. <coughs> And uh, the decoding stage is about understanding the, what, what, what the, 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 statist the, the statistics of the stimulus in the external world <coughs> given the, the response. So trying to figure out what is the stimulus in the external world given the response in the brain. <coughs> so in the following, I'm going to describe this encoding stage and this decoding stage and how we can use this kind of model to go from properties of neurons to uh, p predictions for psychophysics. So the encoding stage, uh, we want to describe the statistics of the responses and the population of neurons in the brain given a stimulus. <coughs> so of course, most uh, sensory neuroscience is about this, about understanding what neurons respond to but here we want to describe this in statistical terms. Um, so first of all, of course, we have to describe, to, to choose how we are going to describe this activity in the population of neurons. And of course, we have at least two choices. Uh, we can describe only the, the, the number of spikes that these neurons are emitting or the exact sequence of spikes. Right? So of course, we have to make assumptions about what the signal is. And in most models that uh, people work with in, in this field, we make this assumption that only the number of spikes or the rate matters. Of course, it's a huge simplification, as I'm sure you, uh, you know, but um, uh, since we, we don't understand uh, much of the coding at this level of the spike sequences, it's a good assumption to start with. <coughs> so the reason why we use statistical measures is because of variability. As you know, there's a lot of variability in the brain. If we sh you show the same stimulus over and over again, you don't get the same uh, sequences of spike, you don't, you don't get the same number of spikes, and that's why we, we want to describe thin, things in, in statistical terms. So we are going to, um, to describe a spike count in terms of a random variable, and we want to describe the activity then uh, using probability distribution, for which we want uh, to find a model that fits the data. Is that clear? So to do this, what we do is we choose a model, so a probability distribution that fits, fits the statistics of the data. And usually that means fitting the mean of the data, so over trials, and uh, second order statistics like the variance of the spike count and correlations in the spike count. So we want to find a model that describes P of R given S, the probability of the response 
uh, of our population of neurons given a stimulus in terms of so the mean and the variability that is the variance and the correlations. That would be a good description of the data we're interested in. So how do we go um, about uh, describing the mean? So the, the mean uh, can be thought to, to correspond uh, with the, the tuning curve. The, w w when people record tuning curves, what they do is they, they, say, they show the same stimulus over and over again, and they count the number of spikes, and they report the average spike count for different, num for different stimuli, and this is the tuning curve. So the tuning curve, as people uh, measure it, uh, correspond to the, the average uh, spike count over trials for different stimuli. So we know, for example, that in primary visual cortex, uh, most neurons are selective to orientations, and we have those bell-shaped tuning curves, uh, for which we have a very simple model, a Gaussian model. For other dimensions, for example, a disparity, uh, a suitable model would be, so we have response curves, uh, where a suitable model would be more something like a sigmoid, right? Uh, this would be true also for contrast. You would have a model um, like, uh, looking like a sigmoid where the neurons would respond more for higher contrast and less for lower contrast. So we have all those dimensions. For example, in primary visual cortex, we have orientation, direction, contrast, uh, disparity. And for each of those, we have tuning curves or response curves that we know the shape of, like uh, Gaussian tuning curves or sigmoidal uh, tuning curves or maybe more funky kind of... Uh, tuning curve that we can use as a model of the average spike count over trials. Is that clear? Yeah. So the tuning curve is the first model we can use to describe the statistics of the response. That's the mean response. Then what we want to do is uh, also describe the noise, of course, the variability. So the, the, the simplest way to describe the, the variability, the first stage, is to describe the variance. <coughs> And as I'm sure you know, so people have also uh, measured variances of spike counts over trials. And people have found that so the higher the response, usually the higher the variability. And there's a relationship between the mean spike count that you record and the variance of the spike count. Right? And this, this relationship is, is usually linear. So the variance is a function of the mean. Sorry, I don't have the, the full extent of my slides. I don't know why. Um, so the variance is usually a, a function, a very simple function of the mean. It's proportional to the mean, and this coefficient of pro proportionality uh, here is called the Fano factor. And often people find a Fano factor which is close to one. It can be a bit more complicated. Sometimes you would have a, a bit of a more complicated model where you have the, you would have the mean to some exponent here, but often. Uh, this is a reasonable uh, model. <coughs> so we have this first model, the tuning curve, and then we know that the variability is such that the variance scales with the mean. So that's already a, a good start for our model. <coughs> so we know that some probability distributions um, have also this property that the, the variance, uh, so, yeah, so as I've said, uh, the final factor is, is often close to one. We have this uh, property that, the, so the Poisson distribution has the variance strictly equal to the mean. Um, so, so often it's, it's used as a good model of, of variability, since it, uh, intrinsically it has this property that the variance is equal to the mean, and I'll show you uh, the Poisson distribution. So that's a, a, a first model that we can use to describe variability in the brain. Um, another model is to use a Gaussian distribution with a variance that would be proportional to the mean with a, a relationship like this, right? where here we can manipulate the, the relationship between the variance and the mean. <coughs> You've seen that before, I'm sure. Yeah? So the Poisson distribution, I'm sure you've seen that also before. So this is just to remind you of the shape, uh, so the equation of the, the, the Poisson distribution. So here we want to describe the spike count uh, for a number of trials, the probability of the spike count for a number of trials given a stimulus. And we imagine we know the, the mean spike count because it, maybe it's given by the tuning curve and we know the tuning curve of this neuron. So that would be F. <clears throat> this is the equation for the Poisson distribution. So this Poisson uh, distribution gives us the probability to have each outcome, so that each number of spikes 
when we know the tuning curve. So for example, if the, the mean is supposed to be 10, like here, the Poisson distribution would look like the black curve. So we know what is the likelihood, the probability to obtain each kind of spike count, each number of spike count over trials. So the Poisson distribution looks very much like a Gaussian distribution for means that are quite high. For, uh, the Poisson distribution is always positive for means that are, are smaller. It looks like a bit of like yeah, a truncated Gaussian here or a distorted uh, bale shape curve here. And so if we want to model the number of spike for one, uh, one trial, then we can sample from this distribution and that would be a good description of the, the, the spike count that we can obtain with this model uh, on a given trial. So the Poisson distribution is a f first model to describe so the, 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 the statistics of responses in terms of spike count for a given stimulus. When we know the tuning curve, it has this property that the variance is strictly equal to the mean, which is similar to the data. Another model that is very frequently used is the Gaussian distribution, as I've said. <coughs> so in, the, in this model, we are going to, uh, to model the spike count on a given trial as uh, the mean uh, spike count, which is going to be given by the tuning curve, plus some noise. And here, this noise is Gaussian, centered on zero uh, with, with some amplitude. And we can fix that amplitude uh, so that the variance is strictly equal to the mean. And then we would have something very similar to a Poisson process or, um, or a function of the mean. So the Gaussian distribution is also a, a model that you can use to describe the variability. Is that clear? <coughs> We want to go further from that. this. We also want to describe the noise uh, between neurons. We want to understand whether the, or describe whether the, the noise between neurons is independent or correlated. <coughs> so it might be that um, uh, neurons are correlated. So for example, um, if neurons are, are positively correlated, so the, when, when one neuron is spiking more, so as more uh, spikes, more spikes than its mean. So, so here for neuron one, uh, this line would indicate the mean spike count. On a given trial, uh, so each point is a given trial, uh, neuron one would spike more than its mean. Neuron two is also spiking more spikes than its average. <coughs> uh, if, if this is uh, often the case, uh, then the, those neurons are correlated. If, if there's no relationship between the noise between one neuron and, it, and another neuron, so when neuron one spikes more than its average, neuron two can either spike more than its average or less than its average, the neurons are independent. So often people uh, plot uh, spike counts like this, so each, each dot again is a given trial. And uh, if, if the neurons are independent, you, you have this kind of circular shape of this cloud. If neurons are correlated, uh, you have an elliptic kind of cloud. <coughs> so, so we want to describe those, uh, those correlations. In, uh, in the data, uh, it's found that neurons are usually positively correlated with weak uh, correlations. The amplitude of these correlations in the cortex is very debated, and people find very different kinds of amplitude for this correlation. Um, it's, a, it's a very active topic to try to understand what, is the, uh, what are the properties of these correlations, how to describe them in the data, and also what is the influence of these correlations for, for coding. And I'll come back to this. So we want to describe the mean, the variance, and the correlations uh, between neurons, the noise correlations. <coughs> so to do this, we can, uh, we can use our Gaussian model, just like before. So here we are going to describe the activity of each neuron as uh, a number of spikes, like before, given by its tuning curve, plus some Gaussian noise, like before. <coughs> but now uh, we can uh, choose a model where the, this noise is, is correlated. So the, the noise is, is, uh, is described by a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And you can parameterize uh, this matrix Q, which represents the, the covariance between, between neurons um, to give it uh, the shape you want. 
So, so here, our model becomes that. So the probability of the response given the stimulus is given by this multivariate Gaussian distribution, um, where so the neurons uh, are described with their mean and a covariance matrix, which uh, can have a shape that you, you give it. In reality, it's not very clear what, it, what should be the shape of this covariance matrix, whether it's more or less uniform, or whether neurons that are closer to each other are more correlated than others, uh, whether it depends on the stimulus, on the, on the stimulus preferences, etc. So often when people play with models like this, they assume a given shape for the covariance matrix and look at the, the functional implications of this, uh, of this correlation structure. It's not clear, again, what, what the data would say about this. So just, um, this, yeah. is a, this is an additive noise model, which you know, it's not multiplying, the noise isn't multiplying the echocolase, it's actually just adding to it. So the, if you had a, yeah. a neuron which you've got quite a high underlying firing rate, the sort of noise would be a relative, relatively smaller part of it, relatively smaller compared to... No, because here the variance scales with the mean. So uh, there's a bit of a confusion. Uh, people talk about additive noise and multiplicative noise, and there's a bit of a confusion. This would be an additive model, but it can still be multiplicative noise in that this can be a function of f. So it's actually multiplicative in that it grows with f. So it's a bit confusing. Yeah. Is that okay? <coughs> so, uh, so that's for the uh, encoding part. So we, we have models to describe. So we have abstracted uh, the level of circuits, and we, we have chosen to describe only the statistics of the responses of our neurons in terms of the mean, the variance, and the covariance. So and now the, the second stage of our exercise is to go towards this decoding stage. So the decoding stage is to do the, the reverse exercise. And now we are looking at this population response. And we want to figure out what is the stimulus in the external world. So that's the decoding problem. <coughs> Uh, so there are different ways to do this, and it's not clear which is the best um, or, or what is the, mo the most uh, plausible for, for describing this transformation in the brain itself. The first assumption we can make is that uh, this transformation is somewhat optimal. That is, uh, when, when the brain is um, going to commit to a, a percept or behavior, it is using all the information that there is in the population response. <clears throat> so, so now in the decoding stage, we want to figure out what is the stimulus in the external world based on this population response uh, and extracting all the information that we can in this population response. So we are going to work with first uh, we can choose to work with an optimal decoder, which is going to extract all the information that there is to guess what is the stimulus in the external world. Whether the brain can do this, and I'll come back to that, it's not clear, but, but we, we can do that. So here the question is, what would perception or behavior be like if all the information here can be used and, and decoded right, to form the percept or the decision? <coughs> So one tool we can use then to decode is to use maximum likelihood. So here, um, so how many of you know maximum likelihood? OK. Um, but it's, it's simpler than the name uh, suggests. <laughs> the idea here is that um, we have a model where we know exactly the encoding stage. So we know exactly p of r given s. And we just want to, uh, to invert the model to guess what is the stimulus, what the stimulus is given the response. <coughs> so we are going, so maximum likelihood, the idea is to choose as an estimate the stimulus which has the maximum probability of generating the response that you observe. So you know all about the encoding model and you observe uh, this kind of, so this is a population response, yeah? So we have a bunch of neurons uh, in V1, for example, and they are ranked by their preferred orientation. And each uh, dot, so is the spike count for each neuron in this population. 
So this is my, uh, my population of neurons. They are responding like this. So for example, this guy, which is selective to zero degrees, is responding with 32 spikes. Eh? This guy is responding the most. I'm looking at this, and I have to figure out what is the stimulus in the world. Maximum likelihood, the idea is that we know exactly the encoding stage. So we know exactly what should the, the response look like for each kind of stimulus in the external world. So the idea really is just to fit this model to the response that we observe <coughs> and choose um, as an estimate the stimulus which would have given the response that best fit the response that we observe. Is that clear? So we observe some uh, responses, and we choose as an estimate the stimulus which has the maximum probability of generating this response that we observe. So we are just inverting the encoding model to decode. So how do you know your output? I mean, it's not going to be output. Um, Say that again? It, for me, my understanding is you, got your, you know your input, you know your output, then you just fit the parameters to get that output. Is that what you're trying to do? But I just don't know how you get this output. <laughs> uh, no, no, here we know. We, we know for all stimuli in the world, we know what should be the statistics of the responses in the brain. So that's the encoding model. Now we are just using this encoding model and we are kind of fitting it to the responses that we observe to figure out what is the stimulus in the external yeah, how world. How do you get this uh, response? Yeah. This is our prediction. We, we are reading out the... How you observe this response? At the spike count, so we are, the idea is that we are measuring, maybe I should say that before, uh, this population response in the brain, we can measure it. The idea is that yeah, we... How do you measure it? Um, so, um, How do you get this uh, experiment result, actually? So this is a, like a model where we are describing... So either, either you are thinking of, of an experimental situation where we can uh, we can record from a, a very large number of neurons. Yeah, the example you showed to me is the uh, water contact one, right? Water contact one, uh, where you were, uh, it started actually, there are multiple experiments. So, for example, if you go in a different area, yeah. then your approach where we have uh, some problem to get. No, no, that, that, that would hold for any part of the brain where you can record a, a large number of neurons at the same time. We assume you can record a large number at the same time, and you have recorded, recorded them long enough so you know this model well enough, so P of R given S. So you, you know about the mean response of those neurons and the variability of those neurons. So you assume, you assume we can somehow, in some way, to record the response of the neuron? Yeah. Uh, it's not say <laughs> possible to every brain area, especially in the deep area. And, and this cannot be done for the human results, right? We only can die so it's, all, it's always possible in models, right? And, and this would hold for e every places where people record with arrays of, of electrodes, for example. So this decoding exercise. Also, people do it with, uh, when they record single electrodes, with single electrodes, one neuron at a time, and then they pull the data and they assume the neurons are independent. So it's, it's, it's applicable to all kind of data where you have recordings from a large number of neurons. Is, the, is, it, is it, in a way though, is it more a question of, is a sort of hypothesis about what neurons, say the next stage of neurons, could read out from a, the, an earlier layer of neurons? So yeah. is, is that really what we're, so you're, I mean, because for those, the next layer of neurons, they will, as a, as a, as a group, be able to get information from all the neurons in the first layer. Yeah, absolutely, yes. So this, is a, this is a sort of hypothesis about what would happen if you have much information that they have. Is that being yeah, I'm really, really interested in this transformation between uh, uh, the representation at some level and uh, the response of the subject. Or you can think of it as yeah, the, the, uh, this being another layer in the brain. So it's, in any case, it's not a homunculus or a little man decoding the activity from a layer of neuron, uh, and um, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's really the transformation I'm interested in. Um, it doesn't have to be explicit. That's what I mean. Yeah. <coughs> it there's there's no need to have an explicit decoding stage. 
but this transformation always exists between some layer, so some population uh, of neurons in the brain to the response or <clears throat> okay, so the, the first way to decode then would be to use an optimal decoder, like maximum likelihood, but this is only feasible if we know uh, exactly the encoding model. <clears throat> um, also, so uh, whether, the, whether the brain can, can do this, can, um, can use something similar to maximum likelihood to do this transformation, it's not clear at all. I think people agree that um, it would have to be an approximation anyway of maximum likelihood, especially for complex distributions. Um, so there is some evidence from psychophysics, and I, I talked about this in the second hour, uh, some evidence that the brain does something similar to that. Um, and there is some literature proposing some neural circuits that could do uh, something similar to maximum likelihood, but it's still uh, debated or yeah, the plausibility of those circuits and, w and whether um, they really work for the kind of computations we are interested in, uh, it's not clear. But some people are interested in this, in trying to figure out whether, whether maximum likelihood can really be implemented in the brain to do this transformation between some population response and, and, and uh, the response of the subject. <clears throat> so if this is too complicated for the brain to do, or if, uh, or if we are this experimentalist trying to decode from the brain and we don't know uh, all about the encoding model, pure var given S, there are some simpler decoding strategies that we can use, and I'm sure you've heard about them. One of them is the winner-take-all mechanism. So here again, we are observing this population of neurons, and we have to figure out what is the stimulus in the external world, and the winner-take-all strategy is very simple. We are just going to pick the neuron that responds most, and we are going to decide that the stimulus that is in the external world is the preferred stimulus for this guy. So here we don't have to know all about the, uh, the encoding model, Pirvar given S. We just have to know about the preferred stimulus for each neuron, and then when we observe the response, we take the neuron that responds most, and, and we decide that because it responds most, it must be that its preferred stimulus is what is in the external world. Is that clear? So the winner-take-all um, is a very simple strategy. It's very simple to implement a winner-take-all with neural circuits. The, the problem is that as a strategy, it's not very efficient at all. Uh, if you look at, in particular, the, the variance of this uh, Decoding strategy, it's very high because it's based, it's based on responses of single neurons instead of taking into account all the populations, and so the efficiency is, is pretty bad. But, um, but it's still used in models, and it, it's very easy to implement. So maybe a more interesting um, strategy, which is still very simple, is that of the population vector. So I'm sure you've, you've heard about this as well. The population vector is a strategy where we are assuming that each neuron in our population is going to vote for its preferred stimulus. So each neuron is voting for its preferred stimulus with a vote uh, which has an amplitude that depends on the amplitude of the response. So for example, this guy which responds a, lo a lot is going to vote for its preferred orientation, for example, 10 degrees, with an amplitude that is over the screen. Uh, it should not be, uh, but it's, it's uh, proportional to the magnitude of the response. And each neuron uh, votes in the same way, so this guy is also voting for its preferred orientation with an amplitude that is a bit less. Each neuron uh, votes in the same way, and then the idea of the population vector is to compute the sum of all these vectors corresponding to all the neurons in the population. <coughs> and the resulting vector, which is the sum of all vectors, is uh, it's going to be much uh, longer than the screen here, and it has uh, an orientation, which is the, the orientation we are going to take as a guess for here the uh, orientation of the stimulus in, in the external world. Is that clear? So the population vector is also a strategy where we don't need to know all the, all the encoding model, P of R given S, we just need to know the preferred stimulus for each neuron. So it's a very uh, simple strategy. 
uh, it has much better properties than the winner take all strategy. In particular, if the tuning curves are large enough, if the noise is Poisson, uh, and if the, if the neurons are uniformly distributed in terms of their stimulus preferences, it can approximate very well maximum likelihood. So it's a very simple strategy, but it can be very efficient in some situations. So there's a lot of people who are working on, on decoding from populations of neurons uh, using those kind of strategies. There's also a literature uh, about um, using uh, so other kinds of decoders that would be uh, so simpler or, or uh, simpler than, uh, than maximum likelihood or non-optimal in some ways. And the question is really about what would be the cost of using those non-optimal decoders? Because the idea is that usually knowing all about the encoding model, P of R given S, is too complex. In particular, if your neurons are correlated, knowing P of R given S means knowing all about the covariance matrix, and that's very hard to, uh, to get. You, you would need a lot of uh, measurements uh, for all your neurons. Um, so, yeah, so that, that would be almost, that would be infe infeasible. So you would have to have some approximations of this anyway. <coughs> so people have looked at the, the cost of using things like the winner take all or the population vector or other kinds of decoders that are constrained in some way. For example, they would be constrained to be linear. Uh, so this is called the optimal linear estimator. So you can try to decode, so figure out what is the stimulus in the external world based on the responses of your neurons in the population. When you train um, this decoder, uh, so you, you choose the optimal weight, so you, you train this decoder to give you the, uh, the response on a set of training data, so you, and you find the optimal weight, and then you give new uh, data, and you try to uh, see what the performance are of this decoder. And uh, so that's called the OLE. It also has good properties in some cases. Then there's also some literature about understanding whether you need to know the correlations to decode, and whether if you use a, a decoding stage that ignores the correlation, that assumes that the neurons are independent, whether your, your, estima your estimates are going to be very wrong or not. Um, and in some cases, again, so it depends on the structure of the correlation, so I've worked on this as well. On some cases, you can use a decoder that ignores the correlation, that assumes that the neurons are independent and still do a very good job at decoding. <coughs> the question again is whether the, the brain, when it does this transformation, it's also reading out, if you, if you will, the, the correlations in, in the population activity to, uh, to transform to, this, to the response or not. Is that, is that okay? So this would, yeah. Would you, would they, in the linear decoder work, for example, that you just showed your intention, I can't just stick to see how that would play and set the weights up to that. It works uh, locally, so you can train uh, around a given orientation. Yes. Uh, but it would, not, it would not work for all orientations. So you would train it for a specific region, and then it would do a very good job in this region. But right, okay. Yeah. <coughs> you're yeah, otherwise, yeah, you would need a multi-layer kind of network. Yeah. Is that clear? So now we have, so I, I have described, so an encode, encoding models and decoding models, and, um, and I'm going to, to go towards trying to predict psychophysics from neural data. Uh, <coughs> but before that, I need to do a little, um, uh, reminder about um, assessing the performances of estimators. So maybe you've seen that before as well. So we have a model like this where we have also I'm using decoder and estimator in, a, in the same way, right? <coughs> so we have a model like this where we have a stimulus in the external world and we present it many times and we have some variability. So each time our model is going to give us some guess about what is the stimulus in the external world. And from trial to trial, even if the stimulus is the same, maybe our guess is going to differ because of the variability at this stage. And we, are, and we can use different kind of estimators, uh, so decoders. And we now take all population vector, maximum likelihood, some kind of crazy stuff. <coughs> uh, the question is, how can we um, 
uh, how, how do people evaluate the performance of an estimator of our, our all, all this uh, transformation? How do you evaluate how good your, your guesses are? And there are two quantities that uh, you usually uh, measure to, to characterize the performances of the estimator. <coughs> the first one is the bias. So the bias um, is the difference between the average guess at this stage and the stimulus in the external world. So it's the difference between the average guess and the stimulus in the external world. Uh, and if, if, uh, if the bias is equal to zero, the estimator is said to be unbiased. <coughs> so that's the first quantity that you can measure. So if on average, yeah, there are your guess is equal to the, to the stimulus in the external world, uh, your estimate is unbiased. And the second quantity you can measure is the, the variability here at this stage. And so you can uh, quantify the variance of your guesses. And uh, there's a very important result that we know from estimation theory is that this variance here is going to be bounded. It cannot be as small, uh, uh, infinitely small. It has to be bounded by a quantity, which depends on Fisher information. Um, so, so the variance, the variance here, is bounded by a quantity, yeah, which depends on the inverse of Fisher information and the derivative of the bias. So, the idea is that at this level, there is a, a finite amount of information, and um, and there is some variability, which is such that. Um, even if you have a perfect decoder at this stage, you can't be perfect. You are limited by the variability at this stage. And this quantity tells you about this limit, the, the, the limit uh, here, which depends on the variability and the properties of the responses at this stage, which is going to limit your precision at that stage. Is that clear? Yeah? How many of you have heard about fission formation? OK. So the following is, uh, is going to be about fission formation. Fission formation is, is really a tool that people use to do this bridging between neural activity and behavior. Um, and so uh, this is what I'm going to describe now. So in this framework, it comes very naturally. So the variance at this stage yeah, is bounded. So it's known as the kramer bound by the quantity, which depends on inverse fission formation and the derivative of the bias. And fission information is expressed, oh, that's a shame I don't have uh, the full equation. Fisher information is dependent on P of R given S, the encoding model. And it's described as a second derivative of log of P of R given S. The idea is that Fisher information here depends on the properties of the neurons, so the mean and, and the variability. Uh, P of R given S is given, as we've seen before, by your tuning curves and either a Poisson model for the variability or a Gaussian model for the variability. So at this stage you can compute at this, at this stage you can compute fission formation, and this is going to give you an idea about the limit for the precision of your estimator at that stage. Is that clear? Oh, it's all, it's it's finished. It's a pure var given s. That's all. But yeah. I have it on another slide. So now, how can we work with our model? to try to relate uh, activity and psychophysical performance. So now it's very easy. We, we've all, we have all the tools that we want. Um, so what kind of things uh, do we want to predict in psychophysics? What, what is being measured in psychophysics? So we are interested in experiments, for example, where people do estimation tasks. So we, you ask people, for example, uh, what kind of orientation they see, and they have to tell you, uh, maybe turning an arrow or comparing with another stimulus, what is the orientation of the stimulus they see. And in some cases, they are, they are going to have illusions, so they are going to be biased. And you are measuring, for example, this bias. So we know that in adaptation or in certain visual illusions, people are biased. And so on average, their guesses are going to be different from the stimulus in the external world. And this is what we measure. So this is the kind of thing we want to predict, this kind of bias. Another thing we want to predict is the, the precision of their perception in terms of discrimination. For example, we have those experiments where we present one, sti one stimulus 
and then another stimulus, and we ask the subjects whether this is the same stimulus or a different orientation here. And we measure the just noticeable difference, so the, the difference that they can reliably detect on a given number of trials. So can we predict this kind of precision as well? <coughs> so here, so in a model like this, um, I hope you, you will be able to see that the, the, this discrimination threshold is going to depend on the overlap between the internal representation for, for the two stimuli. So, um, so they are going to represent the two uh, stimuli with a probability distribution, so because they, they, uh, there is some intrinsic variability. <coughs> and so um, the overlap between those two distribution is going to depend on the bias <coughs> and the variance of the estimates. So for example, if they have an illusion such that the, 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 the difference that, that there is in the external world, they see it as being amplified, um, there, is, there will be, um, th so the, the, these two distribution will be uh, uh, further apart in the internal representation than in the external world. So that's how it depends on the bias, and the width of this distribution is going to depend on the variability of the estimates. So the discrimination threshold is going to depend on the, on the bias of these uh, estimates and the variance of these estimates. Is that clear? Yeah? Would it be, would it be possible for the bias to improve discrimination if it was in the right direction, or does the bias always... Yeah. So bias could actually make things more If you have a repulsive bias, yeah, it helps you for discrimination. Uh, although, in terms of in terms of, of variance, yeah, not in terms of discrimination threshold. Finally, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it 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 uh, yeah. So no, actually, <laughs> in terms of discrimination threshold, the. Uh, um, Yeah, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I'll come back to this. I, I used to know that. <coughs> um, um, yeah, so, so now, so if we want to compare this model, um, this model with the quantities that we uh, measure in psychophysics, we can compare directly the statistical bias of our mod model. Uh, and, and the perceptual bias. <coughs> so if we have this encoding model and decoding model and, and we have a, a constant bias in the output, this corresponds to a perceptual bias. We can also compute so the variance of these estimates <coughs> and, uh, or the standard deviation and then the derivative of the bias and, and that gives us the, the discrimination uh, threshold. Um, so I've not shown the, the math of this but uh, you can find it in my paper. Um, so it's, it's very easy to go from a model like this to the predictions in terms of bias and discrimination threshold. It's the idea. <coughs> and from the, from the crowd, uh, crowd bound, we know as well that uh, even if the, the decoder is optimal, the discrimination threshold is going to be bounded by a quantity which depends on fission formation. So fission formation gives you the, uh, the minimal discrimination threshold that you can obtain if your decoding stage is optimal. Is that clear? So this is a slide on fission formation then. So it's a very important quantity for doing this kind of exercise. Uh, so fission formation again gives you the, the minimal, if you want, discrimination threshold that can be obtained if you have uh, an optimal decoder. Fission formation is expressed in terms of the encoding model, P of R given S. It's related to the peakiness of the likelihood. Um, so, um, yeah. So it can be uh, it can be expressed. So P of R given S, we've seen that we can express it, we can express it in terms of the tuning curve uh, and some uh, noise model. For example, a Poisson model. So for example, if we have a Poisson model, and I'm sorry, the uh, rest of the ex expression is missing. If we have a Poisson model for pure var given S, fission formation would have a, a, a form like this. It's going to be expressed in terms of the derivative of the tuning curve. Um, 
uh, over a quantity here, which really, so it's a, it's a Poisson model, so this is the mean, but it's, it's really uh, uh, representing the, the variance, which is equal to the mean. Um, um, yeah, I should have said also fish information, so, you know, so uh, you, you've probably heard about mutual information, which is expressed in, in bits. Uh, mutual information is a, is a quantity of information theory. Fish information is not fish information, as we've seen, is a quantity of estimation theory. It, it's not expressed in bits at all. It's in, expressed in terms of inverse variance. Um, so it's very, it's very different quantity if you want, although it's related to mutual information, but it's not at all in the same kind of unit and doesn't come out from the same framework. Uh, fish information also is always expressed for a given stimulus. It's how much information in terms of discriminability you have in your neural population for a given stimulus. Um, whereas mutual information usually is about a set of responses and a set of stimuli. So it's how, how well your, your neural activity is coding for a set of stimuli. Fish information is really how well you can discriminate around a given stimulus. And as I will tell you, it, so it's dependent on the tuning curve of the neurons for this stimulus, and in particular, the slopes of the tuning curve around that stimulus. Okay, so now we have all our tools and we can, uh, we can explore now very interesting questions. We can for, play with our encoding models, so our tuning curve and our noise, and we can ask how, what is that going to do for, for performances. If I'm changing the number of neurons here, or if I'm ch changing the shape of the tuning curves, or if I'm changing the variability, and in particular the structure of the correlations, what is this going to predict in terms of the precision of the code, and in particular the discriminability or discrimination performances at this stage, right? And we know, um, so the, the discrimination threshold is, if the decoder is optimal, the discrimination threshold is given by one over the square root of fish information. So we can compute fish information at this stage, given the tuning curves and the, and the noise, and we have a very good idea about discriminability at that stage that we can measure in psychophysics. Is that clear? So that, that was the goal, and that's what we can do now. <coughs> so we can look at the factors that control performance. <coughs> and so intuitively we can think so the, the factors that control performance are the variability, so the, for example the variance from trial to trial. So we can think that of course the less noise the better the performance. But um, in, uh, in, in reality we see that this, this uh, relationship between the, the mean and the variance doesn't, doesn't seem to vary much. So, so for example, in a situation like, like uh, learning, where we, we get better at a given task, it's, it doesn't look like the, the, the variability in the brain is decreasing. <coughs> what seems to be happening is more like that the, the shape of the tuning curves are changing. So a lot of people have initially thought that uh, neurons could sharpen the tuning curves and that, for example, perceptual learning was related to uh, changes in width of the tuning curve. So that's, uh, that's uh, a way, of course, to improve uh, discriminability around the stimulus. So, so if you change the slope of the tuning curve around a given stimulus, you improve the discriminability around the stimulus. <coughs> uh, there's not that much evidence for tuning curve sharpening in the brain, in particular with learning or attention or adaptation. Uh, what seems to happening uh, more frequently uh, mechanisms such as gain modulation. So a lot of people have described uh, uh, perceptual learning or attention or adaptation in terms of gain modulation. Gain modulation is uh, of course a way as well that you can use to change the slope of the tuning curve uh, around a given stimulus. <coughs> So, so, so there are a lot of models out there describing so adaptation, uh, attention, perception, learning in terms of gain modulation with this idea that if you do gain modulation, you change the slope of the tuning curve and that improves the accuracy of the code. Now, uh, fish information is a way to, uh, to formalize this intuition and exactly quantify 
what would be the effect of doing gain modulation on the precision of the code. So, um, so if we have Poisson noise, uh, and so we, we can use the, the definition of fission formation, the second derivative of the log of P of R given S, or P of, uh, so that this R and this N is the same. Uh, this N here uh, is what I call R when I say P of R given S. Uh, so if we plug uh, this model into the, the definition of fission formation, we obtain this form for fission formation. So fission formation for a given stimulus, as I've told you, and in a given neuron is related to the slope of the tuning curve of that neuron for that stimulus, so how steep the tuning curve is around that stimulus over the, 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 the tuning curve for, for this stimulus uh, so the mean response, which is also here equal to the variance. So fission formation is really related to the slope of the tuning curve over the variance for a given stimulus, for a given neuron, sorry. Now the, the nice thing is that fission formation for a population of neurons is just going to be the sum of the fission formation for each neuron. So fission formation for a population of neurons is going to be given by the slope of the tuning curve for each neuron around that stimulus in the population over the, the mean uh, response for all these neurons for this stimulus in the population. So now we have a very nice way to quantify changes in the shape of a tuning curve, <coughs> um, how, how this is going to impact on fission formation and thus on discriminability. So that's for Poisson noise. But so it's very general that fission formation is dependent on the slope over the noise. Um, for Gaussian noise, a fission formation has a similar expression, although it looks more complicated. So if we have Gaussian correlated noise, the model I presented before, so that would be your model for P of R given S. So it's a multivariate Gaussian distribution. You can plug this in again in the definition of fission formation. And now it's uh, three pages of math, but you would end up with an expression like this. So if you have multivariate Gaussian noise, fission formation looks like that. It's similar to before, it's dependent on the slope of the tuning curves for this stimulus over the noise, the covariance matrix. <coughs> and now there's also a second term which depends only on the covariance matrix. Um, yeah, so it depends on the inverse of the covariance matrix and the slope of the, uh, and the derivative of this covariance matrix. So this term, so this term is modulated by the the, the tuning curve of these terms is only dependent on the covariance matrix. And so people have been interested in that term in trying to understand what's the impact of correlations on the precision of the code. Is that clear? Kind of? Let me see. Okay. So, uh, so to finish, I'm just going to give you um, a few uh, examples of how these kind of tools are used in research to try to bridge some neural activity and perception. So how people use them. So for example, you can ask yourself, once you have those tools, you can ask yourself whether the shapes of the tuning curves that you measure are optimal or not for kind of the task you are interested in. And so a lot of people have been interested, to, interested in understanding whether adaptation or maybe attention or maybe learning can be thought as steps towards changing the tuning curve so that they become more optimal in the sense of fish information. And there is some evidence um, that th this would be the case. So for example, this is the work of David McAlpine at UCL. He's recording from the auditory midbrain of the guinea pig and is, uh, is uh, presenting sound levels uh, to those animals and is looking at the, the neural activity and is basically adapting the animals to given, given ranges of sound levels. And what, what he's seeing is that, so he's adapting uh, the animals to this range of sound levels, so around 40 or around 60, and is measuring the, the activity in terms of firing rate for the sound levels. And he's seeing that the tuning curves or the response curve here, they, they change. Right? They change from green if the animal is adapted to 40 to red if the animal is adapted towards 60. 
And what he's doing is, is then measuring fission formation on the right axis, fission formation corresponding to those, to those response curve. <coughs> and then what he's finding is that adapting those response curve like this corresponds to improving fission formation around those uh, frequencies that you are, or sound levels that you are adapting to. So he's making the point then that adaptation in this auditory midbrain can be sort of corresponding to changing the tuning curves so, so that the, the slope is such that fission formation becomes improved at the adapted sound level. Is that clear? So this is the kind of thing you can do. If you see ch tuning curves that are changing, then you can ask yourself whether this corresponds to in improving discrimination or not. And, and, and this gives you a tool to quantify that. Just to, to read the, the part which they got confused about which curves which is the dust, is it the dotted curves, the firing rates, and the, or is it No, this is the, uh, this is the activity and this is uh, Fisher, I think, yeah. The dotted is the fissure. Oh. So he's uh, making the point here yeah, that the maximal fissure is at the adapted. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah, exactly. So, so it's maximal when the slope is maximal, yeah. fissure information. And, uh, and uh, a lot of people have, have done the same kind of exercise for attention and, and learning. So this is a tool that is widely spread. <coughs> Another very important research question is about understanding uh, the impact of variability on the precision of the code, and, and in particular those correlations I've told you about. So, uh, of course, initially people thought that uh, neurons uh, were correlated, but um, so no, neurons, the, the, the variability of neurons maybe uh, could be averaged, averaged out by pooling more and more neurons. But if neurons are correlated, then there might be a limit uh, on this precision that you can achieve by pooling more and more neurons. <coughs> um, what this limit is, though, depends crucially on the structure and the properties of those correlations. And it's, it's very unclear still uh, what's the impact of those correlations in the brain uh, on the precision of the code. <coughs> And uh, it's also uh, an hypothesis that is around now that maybe uh, attention, adaptation, and perceptual learning uh, might act by changing the structure of the correlation so as to improve the code uh, in the sense of fission formation, actually, which is the tool they use. Right? So these are recent papers uh, published in high-level journals. Uh, they, they all propose that the, the, the structure of the correlations or the covariance matrix, this Q matrix in the multivariate uh, Gaussian distribution I showed you before, could be changing with adaptation, attention, or perceptual learning, and ma that might be the way uh, for the brain to improve uh, its representation. <coughs> I worked on something uh, very uh, related to this. I'm going just to describe it very uh, briefly, but I think it's an example of the kind of things you can do. Um, I looked at the, the models of orientation selectivity. So I, I'm sure you, you've heard about models of orientation selectivity in V1. So there are models that assume that V1 is um, producing orientation selectivity. So the, the thalamus would give only uh, broad tuning, and then V1 would sharpen this tuning in orientation and would produce orientation selectivity. That's a sharpening model. or um, um, and, and there's a, or an attractor, uh, people have described this with attractor models as well. There are other people who propose that in fact the, the, the afferents from the thalamus to V1 are precise enough that in fact V1 is not creating orientation selectivity per se, but uh, um, it's, um, it's basically uh, assure, uh, uh, making this orientation selectivity independent of contrast. <coughs> so there were different kinds of models which were proposed before, which corresponded to different kinds of circuits uh, <coughs> in the visual cortex. So, um, so, one, so one model, the sharpening model, was based on mostly recurrent uh, 
recurrent um, connectivity, whereas the, the other module assumes more like a feed-forward scheme where orientation selectivity would be given by the salamus and just modified uh, slightly in, in the visual cortex. So what I've done <coughs> in this paper is I have re-implemented those two models in the same framework. <coughs> so here also with spikes and a large number of connections. <coughs> So I have a retinal level and a, and a V1 level with excited tree neurons and inhibitory neurons, conductance-based integrated fire neurons. <coughs> I have two types of connectivity for this recurrent model or the feed-forward model. <coughs> and the question I've asked here is to try to understand whether those two models were actually uh, similar or not in terms of efficiency of the code, in terms of the predictions they would made for discriminability at the behavioral level. So I'm not sure exactly what I have here. Ah, it's stuck. Ah. <coughs> yeah, so the question I've asked is whether these models were equivalent in terms of information transmission. So what I've done is I've done this exercise of decoding from my models to try to estimate fish information around a given orientation for the two models. <coughs> So here I've used a, a, a linear decoder, so a very simple decoder, which I have trained um, for give, given input output that I knew about and then give, giving a new input to the model and trying to see what the model would guess in terms of the orientation of the stimulus. So very simple decoding scheme, which we know gives us a good estimate of fish information locally for a given orientation. <coughs> so I have played this game of decoding from my model for a very large number of trials to estimate fish information so as to compare my two models. Um, <coughs> the idea that was that the models could spit out the same kind of tuning curves and variability in terms of the variance, but because they had different connectivity, they would actually produce different covariance matrices. So what I found is that um, the two models were not equivalent in terms of information transmission or in terms of discriminability. I found that the no sharpening or the feed forward model, if you want, was much better in terms of fish information than the other. <coughs> Even if the two models could produce very similar tuning curves. Um, I could show that this was not due to the models receiving different information in the input. So they have different information in the input because the connectivity from the salamus to V1 is different in two cases. But uh, we made sure in, in these models that the, in terms of fish information, the amount of information they would receive in the input was the same. <coughs> but we could explain uh, the difference in efficiency by the fact that the variability in the two models in terms of the covariance matrix, in terms of the correlation, was very different. So the two models had different connectivity, recurrent connectivity or more feed-forward types of connectivity, which would generate different kind of variability, which I could quantify. So these are the correlations. So the diagonal is the variance, so the correlations between all my neurons versus all my neurons. <coughs> Attractor models tend to have very specific shapes for their correlation with strong positive and strong negative correlations. And we could show that this structure of correlations was actually bad for fish information. And that, so that model, the fit for model, was much better for fish information. <coughs> so yeah, yeah, so that's the finding was that those two models, which could be made very similar in terms of their output tuning terms and variability, actually made very different predictions in terms of how well they could be used for discriminability, discrimination. <coughs> So there are different correlations and then different information. <coughs> so that's related to the more recent work that people have done where they propose that the covariance structure might change with learning or adaptation and that, that might explain uh, how uh, the precision of the code might change. Yeah. And uh, so finally, that's the final example I'm going to tell you about. I've been uh, more recently interested in this decoding stage. So we know very little about how the brain reads out its own activity. Uh, we don't know whether this is optimal, whether there are constraints, w what exactly is being read out, we, we don't know. And um, I've asked the question about whether the study of illusions, visual illusions, can inform us on how the brain is reading out its own activity. 
<laughs> there are models of this. It's supposed to be uh, related to adaptation to contrast, yeah, which is read out by uh, MT or, and interpreted in terms of changes in motion. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm not sure it's completely explained yet, but it's very strong. <coughs> Uh, but in any case, yeah, it's related to sen it's, it seems to be related to sensory adaptation. Uh, so I've taken this example of sensory adaptation um, to try to answer this question about decoding. So, so maybe I can show you this. So by sensory adaptation, I mean this kind of things where you, you look at this grating and uh, make sure you see it as being vertical. <coughs> Now you fixate on a stimulus like this for something like 30 seconds, which is very long, so we'll do very, we'll do much less. <coughs> but if you look at the first grating again, as I'm sure you know, uh, now you have a, a bias. You see this as being tilted away from the adapter. So I'm interested in this kind of phenomena. <coughs> And the question I'm asking is, so in, in a situation like this, sensory adaptation, we know that what seems to be happening is that the, the encoding stage seems to be changing. If you look at the, the responses, uh, say in V1 here, you are going to see that the neurons respond less and less. So if you think about their tuning curve, it seems that there's a gain modulation such that they decrease in amplitude. So you have a change in the encoding stage with sensory adaptation. <coughs> the question I've asked in this paper is, so what about the decoding stage? If the encoding stage is changing, and now the brain is trying to read out from its own activity, is this decoding stage changing at the same time as the encoding st stage, as it should, uh, to, to stay optimal, or is it not? Right. So I've compared the situation where the decoding stage is changing at the same time as the encoding stage, and uh, a situation where the decoding stage is always uh, fixed at, at this, this time scale of, of adaptation. And I've, um, as I will show you, I, I'll, uh, I've played with very simple encoding models and decoding schemes to try to see in which kind of situation I could predict uh, the results as measured in psychophysics. So I'll show you this very briefly. Uh, <coughs> you can have a look at the paper, it's published. Um, in psychophysics, people have, have looked at sensory adaptation for a long time, and they have measured those biases, so the tilt after effects, how it depends on uh, so the difference between the, the, uh, the image you are looking at compared to the adapter, uh, and so how, how, how um, strong is the bias depending on this difference between the two orientation. And they have also looked at discrimination. So if you look at a uh, given image for a long time, and now you try to discriminate around that image how good or bad you are. And you see very specific patterns of biases and discrimination threshold <coughs> where you are. So you're biased away from the adapter. And in terms of discrimination, the, you are mostly uh, going to be worse. So around the adapter, not at the adapter, but around the adapter. So there are different studies, but you can see there are very specific patterns of results that then you can try to predict with a model in terms of, again, bias and discrimination threshold. I played with a very simple model for the encoding stage where I'm just assuming that adaptation is about changing the tuning curve so that they decrease in amplitude. So with adaptation, I'm assuming that some neurons which respond to the adapter decrease in their amplitude. Of course, I could have done something more fancy, like which also for which there's also evidence in the literature, but it's not as obvious as this, where some neurons could change their width, or they could uh, shift, or they, they could have their variability changing, etc. But I, I kept as a, as a start this very simple model just with the gain modulation. So extremely simple model of, of uh, the encoding stage, where I have this and a Gaussian model for the variability. And then I played with uh, different, uh, I don't have all of it here, but I played with different uh, decoders, which were either fixed, so not changing with adaptation, or changing also with adaptation to take into account the changes in the encoding model. And I played with either optimal decoders or simpler decoder, like the population vector or the winner take all. And, and then I could compute the bias for those models and the discrimination threshold and compare with the psychophysical results. 
it's quite quant qualitative, but since the, the patterns of the results observed in, in psychophysics are, are very well defined, the predictions are still uh, quite well characterized. And what I found in nutshell is that uh, those uh, decoders which were fixed, which would not change with adaptation, <coughs> which as if we're not aware that adaptation had taken place, could give um, predictions in terms of bias, so the tilt after effect, and in terms of discrimination threshold, which were very similar to what was observed in psychophysics. So just an example of the kind of exercise that can be done. <coughs> where, where here we relate explicitly changes in the tuning curves and uh, predictions in terms of bias and discrimination threshold in psychophysics that can be compared as well with the psychophysical data. So that's it for the, uh, this first part. Um, so yeah, so that was about so encoding and decoding and a bit of estimation theory, where this, uh, this idea that we can characterize this cascade of encoding and decoding in terms of bias and variance. And this can be used to try to relate the shape of the tuning curve and the variability to psychophysical performance in terms of bias and discrimination threshold. I introduced fission formation, which people use a lot to try to bridge this gap between neural activity and performance, or so try to measure the precision of the code in a population of neurons. <coughs> uh, so fission formation is always imp expressed in terms of the tuning curve, and in particular the slope of the tuning curve and the noise. <coughs> it, it can be used to, uh, to, to get a threshold on the uh, a bound on the discrimination threshold. It gives you the discrimination threshold that would be obtained if you had an optimal decoder. And so you can use it to explore the factors that impact on the precision of the code, in particular, the shape of the tuning curve, sharpening of the tuning curve, gain modulation, also, also a topic that is uh, quite um, exciting now is uh, whether or not the, the correlations are also changing and what it would impact on, on the precision of the code. That's it. So that's it for the, this first part. Do you have questions, maybe? It's a bit uh, dry, maybe, but I, I hope it gives you an idea about the kind of tools that you can use to try to bridge this gap. And also, if you have any models that produces neural activity, you can play this game of decoding from your model and trying to, to see uh, how well, uh, what kind of performance it, it would uh, predict for discriminability, in particular. Yeah. <coughs> can I ask um, what population of the model do you use? Is it the population of the neural model plus the population of the neural And uh, what exactly could you build the connection with uh, what I have learned in this summer school and previous lectures computational model? Is that uh, Kanbadi or some sort of uh, <coughs> So I should have said maybe this is a this is a high level of abstraction where I got rid of circuits and everything and I and I, and um, I am assuming that starting from a probabilistic descri description of neural activity um, is useful for understanding this bridge. So it can be any kind of neural activity. Uh, I'm working with very simple models. So these are models where we describe in a very abstract way. You Activity. Say uh, my understanding of neuron, my understanding, population is group of neuron, right? So say that again. A group of neuron is yeah. population. Yeah. So how many group is called a one population? Is there any definition here? For example, one hundred neuron is a one population. Can we so say that's also spike in neuron is a one population. So it's a very tricky question, and also uh, one that can be addressed with this kind of framework as well is. If we, you think about psychophysical performance, how many neurons participate in that task? Yeah. The answer is that we, we don't know, right? In a model like this, you want to have as many, you want to have enough neurons so you cover the kind of features you are interested in. So if you have orientation, you want to have neurons that cover the range of orientations uh, so that you can do the task. But in reality, it's, it's not clear at all. Right? So there are no exactly uh, relationships We don't know how many neurons we need, but people do do this decoding exercise using measurements from arrays of neurons where they have 
you know, from 50 to 150 uh, neurons at the same time, and they, and they can predict. So for example, uh, maybe you've seen all this literature on uh, decoding from motor cortex and trying to predict, so in monkeys, the, the intention of movement and reproducing it in a prosthetic arm. So from decoding from the motor cortex, trying to predict what's the intention of movement of the monkey and, and reproducing it in a prosthetic arm. Um, Yeah. Yes, you, you can. But it could be 10,000 as well. Yeah. That's, a, that's also an exercise that we can do with these kind of tools. And it's, um, uh, it, it, the, the answer is a bit tricky. It's trying to yeah, understand how many neurons are involved in a given psychophysical task. And uh, there's a bit of a mystery here, because often people have compared the precision of single neurons and the whole animal. Here in models like this, you would find that with models that, that have like 50 to 100 neurons, you predict the same kind of accuracy as the whole animal, which is not right because we have many more neurons than this. So, so the, um, yeah, so there's a bit of a problem here. So maybe, maybe there's a, so, so the, the readout is not optimal or maybe there are other factors that, that come in. But, um, but the number of neurons that, that should be taken into account to predict a psychophysical task yeah, is, is still unclear. <laughs> These are yeah, very simple constructs, if you want. So we're trying to, buy, to, to build as simple a model of the statistics of the response of a population of neurons to try to relate uh, the two levels. Yeah. Yeah.